Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Elise Anderson. And I'm Kawe Lucas. In our show this time, we'll visit a meeting of the long-established China Seminar, which presents monthly programs about things of interest to those who follow China. Every month or so, the Friends of the East-West Center present the China Seminar. This has been going on for many years, since it was founded by Danny Kwok, longtime Asia scholar at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. The program featured three speakers from China who spoke about the world market for Chinese art and how Chinese art is being repatriated back home to China. The China Seminar takes place under the auspices of the Friends of the East-West Center. It has met for many years at the Maple Garden Chinese Restaurant on Eisenberg Street near the university. The food, of course, is Chinese. <laughs> One of the speakers was Shi Ching Shu, a connoisseur collector authenticator and consultant in Chinese art. Shu does not speak English. His talk was interpreted by David Ding Ye. Shu graduated in 1991 with a BA degree in Chinese art from the Shu So Institute of Fine Arts. Xu then joined the Yangzhou branch of the National Bureau of Cultural Relics as a Chinese art authenticator. In 2002, he opened his own gallery in Shanghai, the Shizu Kaotang Gallery, which means the thatched hut of modesty, to showcase his collection. Chinese collecting and collecting China really has a very long history. It could date all the way back to the Tang Dynasty, when lots of Chinese arts got transferred to the Western world. Even today in Japan, in Nara, you can still see a huge collection of art objects presented to Japanese emperor from Chinese royal families. Throughout the five dynasties of the Tang, Song, Yuan, Ming, Qing, roughly from about 618 to um, 1912, over 1,300 years, um, lots of objects, Chinese art, um, expanded into every corner of the world. The uh, largest number of art objects were exported into the Western world, were mostly through the end of the 19th century to 1930s. During that 40 or 50 years, lots of Chinese Beautiful Chinese treasures um, were lost to the outside world because China was weak at that time. We can see most of them in today's museums around the world. The three decades between the founding of the People's Republic and the uh, Cultural Revolution because of the political reasons and because of Chairman Mao's call on uh, smashing the old, the old things and establishing the new. Lots of Chinese art were destroyed during that three decades. During that 30 years, the connection between China and outside the world in collecting and uh, in art appreciation was also cut off. Uh, things started to change after the Cultural Revolution and when China reopened its doors in 1978. And through Hong Kong and other places, China started to rebuild that connection with the outside world. The next speaker was Beijing-born Kevin Zong, Chief Operating Officer and Director of Sangari International. Zong had his secondary education in Portland, Oregon, then took a BA and MBA from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He joined Sangari in 2014. And just now, our, my colleague, Mr. Xu, and has introduced his collection path experience uh, all over the world. So I will start here in reviewing the Chinese art market development for the past 30 years. Before 1980s, the art trades were very small, especially during the Cultural Revolution. Only a few state-owned antique uh, stores are allowed to do, were allowed to do this business. Otherwise, it would be called the crime of, of speculation. And uh, um, it's almost forbidden. But until 1993 to 1995, the four major auction companies were found in Beijing, and Sangari was one of them, and art market found a new life back to China. At that time, the supply was greater than demand. Everything was very cheap because the whole society was lack of money. According to the economic research that uh, the price of the antiques or paintings or the volume of a trace strongly correlated, highly correlated with the hot money in the society. 
but during that time, the China was very poor. People were so busy about making money instead of buying the collections. You can see from the index that uh, because the economy is still growing up and the art market increased smoothly. But suddenly in 2003, <clears throat> uh, I think you guys, everyone knows what happened. The SARS disease happened. And uh, in greater China area, like Hong Kong, Taiwan, and mainland China, 1,000 people lost their lives. And during that time, I was in Beijing. Uh, it was quite scary. And more than 20 million living in that city. To be honest, no one really came out. The whole city was like a death city. So the economy <clears throat> uh, was damaged. But fortunately, the disease was controlled by the government uh, within one year. And uh, a few incentive plans uh, makes the economy keep growing for the next five years. And our market uh, got back in but just only five years. In 2008, uh, the US uh, subprime, because the financial crisis influenced the whole world, and China was dragged into these disasters. <clears throat> Many people lost their uh, jobs. At that time, uh, Prime Minister Wen Jiabao soon approved a huge stimulus package. That's four trillion RMB, about 600 billion US dollar. When this money injected into the society, everything got really expensive because the inflation was really high. My hometown is in Beijing, and Mr. Xue, he lives in Shanghai. We can tell you in these two cities, for example, the real estate, these four or five years, the real estate price increased at least three to five times. That's really fast. Right now, if you want to buy a small studio, like a 500 square inch in Beijing or Shanghai, it costs you more than 1 million US dollar or 1.5 million US dollar. So at the same time, the art market reached the highest point in the history of PRC. Uh, from this map, you can see <clears throat> in tw uh, 2011, that's the highest uh, point in the history. Its total trade, the uh, volume of trade was about 15 billion US dollar, and it makes China the second largest trading company, our trading company of the whole world. And uh, from the, the, the map on the right side, you can see Beijing takes about 65% of the whole trading volumes in China. And in Shanghai area, it takes about 25%, but the rest of the whole nation, only 10%. So in 2011, Beijing was the, uh, the volume of trade was the largest of the whole world. But of course, not everyone uh, or not every buyer buy those uh, uh, antiques or paintings on collection purpose. Actually, many of them were on uh, gift purpose. They buy it to, 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 as a gift for the leaders or their friends. Actually, this is part of the corruptions. So in 2012, <clears throat> the new government is established and uh, Xi Jinping became the, Mr. Xi Jinping became the chairman of China. He was so born, uh, he was born as uh, we all know, he was born in the red family. His style of work was very different with the former leaders. The first move was to fight against uh, corruptions. Uh, from the map on the left, we can see, obviously, it's very successful. <laughs> Four years later, uh, the, the, the volume of trade of art down to 50% off. So it's like 7 billion US dollar last year. Maybe uh, the, the economy is uh, slowing down in China is another concern, but four year, 50% off, that's very unusual. So for us, we believe because the anti-corruption move, so the, 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 the buyers who want to uh, buy those antiques for gift has gone. So right now, only the real collectors are left in this market. Of course, this is bad for business, uh, we, we don't earn that much money, but actually we're happy to see this because the real uh, collectors who knows the value of those antiques are the only buyers right now. We also heard from Irene of Sungari International. Sungari was established in 1995 and has since become known as one of the world's most important auction houses for Chinese art. My name is Irene and I've been working for Sungari International for uh, almost two years. Uh, I was studying in Japan during university and I worked there for two years. And two years before, Kevin gave me a call saying, Irene, why don't, why don't you come back? Uh, we have a job 
p position open here. So two days after he called me, I flew back to China to attend their spring auction. It was my first time attending an, au an artwork auction in China. So I got so interested and I quit my job and got back to China within two weeks. So here I am. And because of that, yeah, that um, event, I, would, I have this opportunity to be here, so I consider myself very lucky. Today, first, I'm going to introduce a little bit about our company. Uh, we were founded, we were established in 19, uh, 1995, and we were one of the first and also largest auction companies in China. At the time when we were established, we, uh, we were established in the in purpose of retrieving uh, lost national treasures. And that's what we did in, 2000, uh, in, in the year of 2000. We successfully retrieved the national treasure, you know, the three bronze uh, animal heads, which was uh, stolen, not really stolen, which uh, used to be the, in the old, <laughs> the old uh, summer palace, as everybody know. And we would retreat them from Hong Kong. At that time, uh, the, the press and the public gave us very high praise for the event. And also in 2001, uh, for the first time, we presented six pieces of Shi Qu Bao Ji. Uh, Shi Qu Bao Ji is an uh, imperial book catalog, which, uh, which included um, all the finest, the, the finest paintings from Song and Yuan and Ming, and Ming dynasty. So it was actually the first time uh, Shi, uh, the, the paintings in Shi Qu Bao Ji collection presented in auction market. Uh, and eventually we initiated a very new trend uh, for ancient painting. Also in, 2000, in 2002, uh, we retrieved another piece, Yan Shan Ming, from Song artist Mi Fu. And it was uh, the only two, one of the only two that existed on, uh, in the world. And we, we, we retrieved it from, from Japan. And in 2009, we auctioned another artwork uh, paying tribute with ca captives from the West. And it was the first Chinese artwork auctioned exceeded uh, 100 uh, million RMB in China. And we, and that time we created the 100 million mark in China. And last year in 2015, it was our 20th anniversary since our establishment. And uh, the hammer dropped with a total transaction of uh, 320 mil uh, million at the close rate of uh, 70.3%, uh, 70 which is very high on for, for, our, uh, for auction houses. And we attracted a house full of people. Um, that was when uh, we, we sensed the tone that the market is actually getting back. Uh, since 2015, we started our world one tr uh, worldwide trip, and we went to North America, uh, the six cities in, in America, and two cities in Canada. And we also went to uh, Japan and Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia uh, for open collection. And we, we've seen many, many great collections over there as well. So uh, for the, as, as the um, auction house, as the young generation for us, it's not only a place for selling and buying, but it is also a platform which provides the opportunity for our young people to get to learn about the cultural legacy and also the stories which uh, was carried on the items that we never had the chance to witness. So, for example, this is a uh, this is a a set of two volumes of books that we auctioned this uh, this year. It is from uh, the Imperial Book Collection catalog called Tian Lu Ling Lang. So, uh, the name Tian Lu actually de derives from Tian Lu Pavilion, which was the name of book collection archive uh, dated back to uh, Han Han Dynasty, established by uh, Emperor Liu Bang. And also Ling Lang stands for Dazzle of Jade, uh, representing the richness and fineness of the books. So about the Tianlu Ling Lang story, um, 
So uh, at the at the first in the 1744 in the year of 1744. Uh, Emperor Qianlong called on a group of most knowledgeable scholars to select the finest books around China since Song Dynasty, also through Yuan and Ming Dynasty, and ten volumes volumes of catalog was ad, uh, were edited, uh, and uh, more than uh, more than four hundred books were kept in record. And they were all kept in this uh, Zhao Ren Palace down here. I took the picture. <laughs> And um, uh, after, uh, after the coronation of he, Emperor Qianlong's son, so it's uh, Emperor Jia Jing, uh, he continued uh, to edit uh, the catalog. So 20 more volumes of the catalog were uh, edited with uh, more than 12,000 books in record. Also included the finest book of Song, Yuan, and Ming Dynasty. But unfortunately, after uh, the, the second year after the coronation of Jia Qing Emperor, uh, there was a fire disaster which destro completely destroyed Zhao uh, Ren Palace. So all the book collection were destroyed. Uh, Qianlong, Emperor Qianlong at that time was very furious about, about the, the accident. But uh, after the burn down, he recalled, uh, he uh, called on the restoration of the book, book collection again. So again, more than 600 books were selected and put in the collection. According to the re uh, record, till 1925, only 311 of them remained. And some of them are brought to uh, Taiwan. And the rest of them were given to Pujie by the last emperor, Pu Yi. But now they all spread it around in the society. And we're very, very lucky to retrieve two of them this year for the auction. And all the scholars and collectors, were, uh, we, we draw a very high attention of the public this year. And scholars and uh, collectors, they all gathered around at the auction. And uh, the hammer dropped at 20 million RMB uh, at the end. But uh, to, as, as far as uh, we are concerned, uh, it's not only about numbers, but we can, it, it also represents the value of the books, of, of the culture, of the legacy in the public's eyes. And we're very excited about it. So uh, through the history of Songari from the three bronze animal, uh, animal heads to Yan Shanming to Tian Lu Ling Lang, um, the cultural value of each item is the, always the core of our company's uh, vision. And not only within China, but also throughout the world. And uh, Chinese art is no longer on the only treasure uh, in Chinese people's heart, but also for foreign collectors. Uh, taking Robert Ellsworth as an example, uh, he is the most influential Chinese art collector as an Amer uh, American. Uh, he started very early since a teenager, and after uh, his high school dropout, he started working as a, uh, at a jewelry, uh, jewelry shop. That's where and when uh, he started getting to know about Chinese art. And his first travel to China was in uh, 1979, where uh, he got to see the warehouse uh, uh, in which all the confiscated uh, art, art pieces were stored because as uh, Kevin introduced at that time, art transactions were for, for, uh, for, uh, prohibited. So uh, the artworks were all confiscated and stored in the warehouse. So he went to China and he got to see those art, artworks and got very interested and he started buying and collecting. Uh, and after elsewhere, uh, there are pretty uh, many of the famous people like uh, John Rockefeller III and Florence and Herbert Irving and also Sir Joseph Edward Houghton. They're all very famous Chinese art co uh, collectors. And uh, in, the late of uh, in the late time of their life, they all donated very m a large part of their collection to either nonprofit uh, organizations or to the art museum like um, the Metropolitan Museum. So uh, from here you can see that uh, it doesn't matter who you are or where you are. 
uh, as long as it is where your passion lays, you can always get uh, inside, uh, uh, get the essence of any culture that you're interested. And uh, actually, Robert elsewhere was uh, became an honorary Chinese citizen uh, uh, in the late uh, in the late of his life, and he was actually one of the only four uh, foreigners who got uh, who became uh, honorary honorary Chinese citizen after 1949. The other three are Russians, and he's the only American. <laughs> But uh, as what we say, uh, this is where our passion lays, and we all, as a as an auctioneer, we always call us uh, the transmitter and the passenger of uh, of the cultural legacy, and we'll keep on uh, passing on the cultural legacy to many many people, not only in China but also uh, in to people around the whole world. Sungari has had many important transactions in Chinese art, including the sale of Mifu's Yanshan Ming, an extremely valuable thousand-year-old work of Chinese art, in 2002. We were pleased to attend this China seminar as many before, and we were delighted to hear and tape these speakers and see the interest of the attendees who came to see them. We'd like to see the China seminar continue for many years, bringing this kind of scholarship to our community and enriching Hawaii's bridge to Asia and our heritage and connection with Chinese history and culture. Indeed, this is all part of the culture of Hawaii. Thanks to the friends of the East-West Center for making the China seminar possible. Keep up the good work. In January, there will be another China seminar program. It will feature a talk by Richard Hornick, a longtime journalist and former executive editor of Asia Week. He will speak about the challenge of Xi Jinping. Can China avoid economic stagnation? It's an important question for China and for the U.S. too. We'll be sure to cover that program, so stay tuned for more on ThinkTech on OC16, raising global awareness in Hawaii. And now, let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. There's so much happening in Hawaii. Sometimes things happen under the radar and we don't hear much about them. But ThinkTech will take you there. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week to stay current on what's happening in government, industry, academia, and communities around the islands and the world. Remember also that ThinkTech broadcasts its daily talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays, and then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. And some people listen to them all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show or if you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. For our audio stream, go to thinktechhawaii.com slash radio. And good news, ThinkTech will now be uploading its talk shows as podcasts on iTunes. Stay iTuned for more. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links, or sign up on our email list to get the daily docket of our upcoming shows and uploads. ThinkTech has a high-tech green screen First Amendment studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to be part of our live audience or participate in our programs and help us raise public awareness, contact us at think at thinktechhawaii.com. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives in Hawaii. We want to stay in touch with you and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. <laughs>
And in fact, you can call in and join our talk shows live. While you're watching any of our shows, you can call us at 415-871-2474 and pose a question or make a comment to participate in the discussion. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech, but first, we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Cowie, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Cowie does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Elise Anderson. And I'm Kali Lucas. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.